Hi, and welcome to the webinar. We have Asi Barak from Games for Change, who's also a faculty member running Games for Change. And so I'll leave it to you. Thank you, Erin. So uh, welcome, everyone. And um, what we're going to do today, uh, we're going to speak a bit about the idea that we use games for social change. That would be the first part, we'll talk about the why and we'll give a few examples of successful games. Uh, the second part will be more about the class. So we'll see how we translate everything we, we discussed in the first part into the, the context of uh, the School of Visual Arts and the program of Design for Social Innovation. So let's start. Um, I titled the presentation, With Great Power Comes Great Responsibility than uh, ever before, uh, we, we had a chance to kind of look at the power of games and what, what gaming can, can mean to our lives. And, um, and personally, five years ago, um, games were kind of very uh, marginal in our lives. And, and even for me, it was hard to uh, explain to people how they could be used outside of entertainment. It seems that in 2011, it's much easier a case to sell and people understand that gaming are around us. You don't need to be a gamer, you don't need to be a 13-year-old uh, guy in a, with a console and a pizza box. And we're talking about people that uh, you know play games on the subway, on mobile, they play games at home or at work on Facebook, and, and games are basically everywhere. And not to mention games that are non-digital, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, I'm, I'm kind of presenting from two perspectives. One is, uh, actually three. One is obviously the faculty of the School of uh, Visual Arts and, and this program, DSI. But it's also the idea that I'm uh, coming from a, a for-profit company that I, I founded a few years back called Impact Games. And now I'm running a non-profit organization called Games for Change. So the whole idea that I've seen games being sold, but I'm also seeing games being used for causes and kind of trying to promote change. Um, I'm coming from a very small place called Israel. And just uh, to put the red dot on the map, you, you're kind of invading three neighboring countries. Um, and that was, that was my uh, beginning at the age of 33. Um, sorry, next, next slide, we're with the age of five. And, uh, and here you, you see an authentic drawing that I made as a kid, my mother, uh, was kind enough to, to save it and, uh, and show it to me after years. And, and it just shows you what a, a kid at the age of five in Israel is growing up with. And you know, the, this, the situation is very intense, the conflict is all around you. And, um, and again, this is, this is something I did uh, when I was five. Um, and then 13 years later, uh, you actually go to the army, so the whole you know, what was before a, a drawing and a virtual thing becomes very real. Um, if you weren't sure who I am in the picture, I'm the guy <laughs> with a circle around his head. And, um, and, and that was, again, uh, facing, uh, facing the reality, facing the conflict. I did it for five years. I was an officer. And kind of after that, I, I really needed a break. And I basically went to the entertainment industry in Israel. I uh, worked for an IT company, and, um, and I'm telling you my personal story because I'm, I think it's also uh, relevant to many of you that are kind of, you know, looking for their, this path in life or finding purpose. And this happened to me at the age of 33, that suddenly I realized that I'm doing all those, you know, entertainment products, mobile applications. Uh, I was traveling every two weeks to another exotic country around the world selling dating applications. But at the same time, something was missing. And even more so, there was a whole disconnect between what I'm doing at my profession and what's happening around me. You know, the idea that the conflict is still there and what I'm doing is nothing to do with, with the thing that's really matter in the world. So the next step was to go out on a journey. So we're back in the map and we're finding another small place called Pittsburgh. And I traveled to Pittsburgh at the age of 33 to go to Carnegie Mellon. And Carnegie Mellon University, which, which I think was a great choice, and I'm really happy for, for finding it by accident. M maybe some of you found this program by accident, 
and I hope you'll have the same uh, the same kind of uh, uh, experience that I I went through with Carnegie Mellon. Uh, it was very early uh, back then. Right now, it's a very known program and very pioneering in the whole idea that you take art, you take technology, and you you know combine it with meaning. Um, the guy that I met there, uh, that was my mentor and professor, is Randy Pausch. Uh, some of you might know Randy from the last lecture. Um, if not, I, I really recommend you to check it on YouTube. It's a video that got million, millions of views, became a bestseller, and uh, Randy is, is, is dead for, uh, for a few years now. But that was the last lecture he made when he knew that he has only um, four to six months to live. And, um, and the whole idea of how we achieve and fulfill these childhood dreams uh, was a very inspiring story. Um, when I met him, he was still uh, uh, the founder and professor of the program. And uh, when I came at the age of 33, all the other students were 23, 22. And, uh, and I took the opportunity to pitch a project. And this is another thing that I think is very relevant to the, the idea of this program, that it's not only what you do, uh, after the two years you're at the program, it's also what you can do to change the world while in school. And in some cases, in school, you have more opportunities to test the boundaries, more opportunities to do things that are very unique. And again, I, was, I think I was lucky to find this program and the opportunity. And I pitched a project that uh, you know, was kind of my idea. And I, I brought together a team of students with me. And the idea was to create a, a game. And remember, it's like 2004. The idea was to create a video game around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. When I told the idea to people, the reaction, including from Randy Pausch, was, you're crazy, you're absolutely crazy. And uh, in, in his language, it was widely out of scope. Uh, he thought it's very interesting, but that I have no uh, chance whatsoever to do it in one semester, even not in two semesters with a group of students. And it's really crazy and ambitious. Uh, but again, to, to Randy's uh, credit, I would say that he allowed us to, to try and he allowed us to do it. And I'm sure that uh, we'll do the same in our program. The whole idea that if you have a dream and if you have a vision, you can really go for it. And um, what started as a, stu uh, a student project became a commercial product and became a company. And we actually uh, took Peacemaker to... Uh, publish it uh, all over the world. We sold over than um, 100,000 copies. And the whole idea that you can take this media that is usually regarded as very shallow and violent and deal with the most um,
as you can see here, the perception that not only that they're not really contributing to, uh, to us intellectually or emotionally, in some cases they're even bad for us or bad for our kids. Um, another criticism from, from someone like Roger Ebert is not necessarily saying that uh, games are bad, uh, but it's also dismissive in the sense that no, no matter how hard we try and uh, how amazing our design will be, we never get to the level of traditional media. We never, we never get a masterpiece like like a great movie is. And I disagree with both views, but but this is what we have to struggle with. Um, same time, when we talk about the power, we're talking about a huge industry all over the world that in many countries already surpassed uh, music and and movies, uh, 60 billion over 60 billion dollar. We're talking about huge amounts of players. 100 million is just. A, a one number that I took from one of the more successful Facebook games called uh, Cityville. So at, at its peak, 100 million were actively playing the game on a daily basis. And this, this is huge. This is something that you don't have with, with any other media. Definitely not at the same time as a social experience. Another number is, is the next one, 407 million hours a month. This is a, a Nielsen... Uh, a, recent survey that says that games basically go to number two um, of all internet activities after social network. And in that, in that basically uh, moving above email. So people are playing games online more than they use email. Um, now let's talk about the responsibility. So you remember we took this, the uh, famous uh, Spider-Man quote, with great power comes great responsibility. If we're talking about such power and such influence, what it means beyond the, the numbers and beyond the stats is that my daughter that is here, uh, Amalia, uh, she's now two years and a half, is going to be influenced by games of all forms, probably more than any other media in her life, um, in her lifetime. So she's basically going to play games, she's already playing games, obviously, on iPhone or iPads. And, um, and that means that as designers, we, we need to do something different. Uh, if, if we wanted to take responsibility on, on the people we affect. This is not a new idea. So if you look at traditional media, the whole idea that you could communicate social agenda, that you could make meaningful impact, that you can actually convey very uh, deep thoughts or deep ideas is, is not new at all. Uh, I took Charles Dickens as an example for books basically going and, and tackling every meaningful issue of, of his time. Uh, let's look at other examples. Let's look at, uh, at comic books. And we're not here talking only about um, kind of a few, uh, a, a few products. We're talking about a whole industry that changed its name. And from comic books, we started to see a new genre of graphic novels. Again, the whole idea that you could tell personal stories like Persopolis or like uh, Mouse, uh, through this media that just like games was regarded very shallow and uh, in some in some periods of the of the 40s and 50s even uh, really damaging the kids' minds. Um, TV shows obviously could deal with serious issues, and uh, and Mash is one of the most viewed uh, series of all time in the context of the war zone. Um, documentaries, this, this is something that is, is obvious to all of us, but wasn't obvious 30, 40 years ago. And Al Gore, uh, with a very uh, basic concept of a documentary, takes an issue like climate change and bringing it to the topic of conversation all over the world. Um, even the Oscars, let's look at something that is very mainstream, very uh, kind of uh, blockbuster oriented, and let's look at some of the winners and the nominees of last years, we will see a lot of social issues and, and very serious issues dealt with uh, uh, through movies. So we believe that games could be meaningful too, 
and this is kind of the agenda of Games for Change as, as an organization, but it's also something that we want to do in, in, in the course and, and the program here, the idea that when you come to the class, um, you can use the, the media of games that uh, is becoming more dominant than any other media uh, and really address any issue that you'd like and, and any vision you have. Um, I want to uh, speak a bit uh, uh, about uh, where we are in terms of this movement, of this idea that you could use games for social agenda. Um, it started as an event, and, um, and this year we had the eighth of its, of its uh, kind. Um, in 2004, there were 20 people that came to the event. In 2011, we had 800, and we had Al Gore, Mr. Social Change, as the keynote of the event. So it just shows you the, the progress and what it means. Each one of those cases, and I'll, I'll talk about Sandra Day O'Connor's project later, but all of them started to be involved with game projects uh, on a national scale. Um, another another uh, thing that is, is really taking, uh, um, taking momentum is the whole idea that research, uh, very interesting research is start to showing what games are actually doing and how they're, uh, not only that they're not damaging, they're actually promoting 21st century skills and, and different kind of thinking that we didn't have with traditional media or with the traditional way that schools are, are operating. Um, and, you know, all this together, this momentum, mainstream adoption, the, the research are leading to the fact that some of the uh, most dominant uh, organizations in social innovation and social impact are actually using games and funding games, from the White House to NASA, to governments, uh, corporations, uh, foundations, uh, who, I mean, basically now we're almost like in a, in a place where not only that we don't need to convince anyone, it, it seems like all, everyone wants to play. Everyone wants to, to play in this, uh, in this emerging space. Um, these are some of the new chapters that we started around the world. So the whole idea that it's also a global idea. It's no longer just a US-centric thing. Um, I'm going to skip that for a second. And one thing that we're really looking at now is, is how we make it more sustainable. So the whole idea that until now, we had a few very nice cases and success stories, but we want to see how this community is becoming a, a marketplace for ideas or, or a, a, almost like a social change engine. And, um, and this, this is also relevant for the class because it means that there is a future. So if you go to the class and you do something really cool uh, that, that uh, is around gaming, I want to show you five. We're good. Okay. So, uh, the first case that I want to sh to to show you, and this is more like to sh to show you the numbers, because one thing that we we always had is is really a great idea, and and some of the headlines we had in the press were always, uh, you know, wow, games could change the world, and what I want to show you today are some of the numbers, the metrics, like what, what, it really, what, what it's really doing and how many people could you really affect with this. Um, iCivics is a project that Sandra Day O'Connor started. The story goes like this. She retired from the Supreme Court and, and started asking kids, what are the three branches of government? And, and uh, no one could answer. Or, you know, she had really poor, poor percentage of, of kids that actually knew. But when she asked them who are the three judges of American Idol, they were like, boom, 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 boom. They all knew the answer. And she understood that, you know, popular media should be the way for her to get people to understand, especially kids, how the government works. And she chose video games. And it was a, a more like an instinct than anything else because she saw her grandkids playing games. And since then, since she announced the initiative of iCivics, her group made 10 different games you can play the president, you can understand the uh, legislative process, uh, the court system, really, 
three is very nice and, and they're all free and in terms of numbers we're talking about 1.2 million players in school since they launched it um, 50 states all across the US and in terms of evaluation that becomes very important in, in our field the idea of can we measure what really happens when, when the kids play the game uh, and what do they say after the experience we see that there is not only a, an increase in learning and understanding of how the government works, there's also the idea that they actually take the game from the school to do uh, to play at home for fun. And that's usually something you can say about a textbook. Uh, case number two, developing world. This is something that is a very new trend that I'm very excited about. We're doing a few projects now. I'm going to tell you one, ex to give you one example example from a, a, an Indian developer called ZMQ. Look at the, at the reach. 67 million devices. The game was around HIV. A very basic games for very simple phones. We're not talking about iPhone. We're talking about feature phones, kind of what we used five years ago. Um, great reach, great evaluation metrics again. The idea that you can reach people that are the hardest to reach. And unlike in the US or, or Europe, the competition is very different because there's less competition with entertainment. Um, there's more time to spend with what you're creating and, and arguably there's more impact. Case number three, direct action. Uh, this is something that came f especially from Facebook and the iPhone. The idea that you can start creating games that are not only living in the virtual world, they're actually connected to some real action out there. And, um, Free rice is a very simple example. Um, people can play free rice. It was actually funded and launched by the UN. It's a word game more than anything else. It's a spelling game. But every time you get the answer right, rice is donated in the real world. And it's still on and you can play it this minute, um, maybe after the, after the webinar. But uh, in terms of, of uh, metrics and numbers, look what happens on a daily basis. 8 million page views for free rice that actually donates 45 million grains of rice to feed um, 2,500 people every day, just as a result of people playing a game. Case number four, youth making games. So here is a new idea. And again, we're getting more sophisticated and we're thinking about more ways to, to impact through this media. So now the whole idea that it's not only that kids could learn by playing games, they could learn a lot by designing games. Um, and you know, in this context of our program, it's, it's very clear, but, um, but we see more and more educators and more and more platforms that are created to enable this. Um, this is just a very quick landscape of, of some of the platforms out there that allow kids without any knowledge of coding to actually make games just by moving blocks around and, and uh, and using uh, very simple tools. Um, and one thing that probably most of you don't know, but you know, you can check it out and it's out there for the second year, the White House announced a national STEM challenge. STEM is the new slogan that, uh, for those of you who don't know, stands for science, tech, engineering, and math, which is the top uh, agenda of the White House and the federal government now in terms of education. And the whole National STEM Challenge is around creating games, kids creating games that deal with STEM. Um, another example is Scholastic. Um, those awards are, are out there for 80 years. And some of the winners as high school students are people like De Andy Warhol or Capote. And in this case, for the last uh, two years, they also use game design as one of the categories. Again, putting it in the same level as as painting, sculpture, and other, other disciplines. And the last case that I want to talk about is, is probably the deepest uh, and most interesting evaluation ever did on a video game. The game is called Remission. And Remission was a game for the tar uh, targets kids that have uh, cancer, patients. And they did a very robust and expensive evaluation just to prove the impact of that game. They did a test of a group that played the game versus a group that never saw the game, all, all treated for cancer. And look at the conclusion. And they, they published it not in game 
uh, journals or game publications. They went and published it in, in medical publications with a group of uh, PhDs. And uh, they showed that the treatment actually improved as a result of playing the game. So the kids were more consistent in taking their drugs just by playing this video game that was created for that purpose. Uh, another thing they went and, and did, and this is, if I'm talking about trends, this is even, um, even more recent and more exciting than anything in evaluation is brain research. The whole idea that you can map areas in, in the brain and, and start to understand how games are affecting the brain in different ways than, than traditional media. Um, so the teaser for the next part would be that your game could be definitely added to this list. Will take you probably two three years to make it but we, we'll talk about that as well and maybe we'll do a pause to answer some questions i think that sounds like a great idea <laughs> if anyone has questions you can write them into the box and be happy to just take a break and answer anything that's come up um, you can see the q a box down to the right okay so we'll, we'll give a few minutes for questions and then uh, we'll try to answer them quickly Yes. How they fit into the discussion. So, so in, in essence, the, the way, and we'll talk about it in the, in the second part also in terms of our methodology for the class, mm -hmm. but basically we, we look at platform, like the choice of technology or non-technology mm -hmm. as part of your design process. Mm -hmm. So it's not only about creative. You know, many times people come to us, even on foundations or NGOs, and say, you know, I have this amazing, cool idea. And we're like, wait, let's, let's go step by step. Who's your audience? Um, what's the context? Uh, what are you trying to achieve? And then the choice of platform is very, very tied to that uh, thought process. And to me, uh, making a street game, a game that has no technology involved, is a choice of platform uh, for certain ideas or certain um, you know, objectives, that might be the best way to go. Um, or light technology, maybe it's a street game with some use of mobile technology. Board games could be very effective in the developing world. Same card games as well. And so again, this is a choice based on, on your audience and other factors. So we have a question from Raffaello, and it says, have you worked with Jane McGonagall before? Yeah, Jane McGonagall is, uh, is a good friend, she's on our advice advisory board uh, she's a uh, part of the movement and um, she's she's participating in our events uh, she's definitely one of the ambassadors for, for that idea mm -hmm. and um, she's she's uh, especially uh, uh, good and and uh, and experience with uh, what's called ARGs alternate reality games alternate reality games are games that go beyond the screen. So the whole idea that people go and, and collect clues in the real world and then, uh, you know, find the graffiti and uh, and this is how they make progress. And this is something she's she's very excited about. And, uh, and I, I recommend to watch her TED talk, which is very good for 2010. Um, and Rafael is also asking if you can view a recording of this later and all of our webinars will be recorded and will be made available. So website and we'll also send out a link to that and we can also put the presentation mm -hmm. Sweet. so if there are no other questions we can move forward if that could be you. yeah let's let's uh, down, uh, upload the, the second part yeah So, so the idea, I, I just want to kind of connect the two. Oh, I, have to go to the beginning. I just want to connect the two parts and say, 
you know, I, I ended the I ended the presentation with your game here, uh, and, and it's not just a slogan. I mean, making games might seem very, very complex, and some of them are very complex. I mean, people are now companies are making games with with teams of over two hundred people sometimes for many years with budgets that are in in the dozens of millions of dollars, but there are also uh, games that are created by one or two person team. And uh, especially when they're not uh, digital, but also in the digital space, you will see more and more artists and more and more people that have kind of social agenda that are making very small but effective games. Um, and, and I think there are more ways to be involved in games, just uh, pure design uh, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of uh, contributing to the content. Uh, contributing to the strategy around them, uh, so I think it's again it's a very exciting moment and and uh, an opportunity to join in. Um, what I want to to uh, go over now is kind of our methodology of thinking about designing games, um, and this is what we're going to do in the class. So so the idea of this class won't be that we're just uh, um, designing in theory. We're actually going to make products, and um, no worries. I mean, we're going to be to be there to help if someone really needs a boost in technology or or to find the right tools. Uh, but at the same time, you're going to choose whatever fits your idea and whatever fits um, your purpose with our guidance. And, um, and the idea is that at the end of the semester, you would have at least one product, maybe even more, that you actually pitched. That you uh, thought about very, very uh, in a very structured way, and you kind of uh, found a way to make it tangible. So it's not going to be only an idea on paper. And the way we kind of uh, think about it, we call it the eight steps, is a process that is, um, as I mentioned before, it's much more than just thinking about the creative idea. It's a process that starts with understanding who you're actually making this product for and ending with how you're going to measure the impact of the product and this is kind of a loop that uh, um, is not really linear because you jump from one uh, circle to the other throughout the process and I think it, it could fit many other design assignments but it's definitely uh, something that we, we saw very effective in thinking about games and the idea is also that when you make a game for change, when you make a game for social causes, you're actually a publisher. You're not only a designer. Because it's so new, there are no publishers in this space. There are no people that are going to solve marketing and distribution for you. So a lot of what we're going to see here is the idea that you need to at least be involved with all of those two steps. The first two steps uh, uh, that are probably more important than anything else, are figuring out your, your audience. Usually we do it in a very, very deep way. So it's not just answering the age range. Um, it's really going very deep into, OK, so what's the age group? But what, what's the gender? What's their psychology? What's their gaming ability? Because in some places that we're now designing games for people who have not necessarily played games before. Um, what in terms of the subject matter, what their attitude, so for example, if it's a game around farming uh, and changing some practices that uh, a certain population has into a more sustainable farming solution, what's their attitude around the change? And why are they doing their traditional, uh, uh, the things in the, the traditional way they're doing? Context is very important as well. This is number two. That's the whole idea that Games could be played in many different ways. And, and, um, and it's very different if you create a game to pe uh, for pe people at home or on the street and you expect them to find the game on their own or if you create a game for a moderated environment like school or a community program uh, or if you're going to have a facilitation by an NGO. It makes huge difference in the way you think about it and even the materials that you're going to, to attach to the game. Um, the third step, and something that we're going to emphasize uh, in the class a lot, because 
it's probably uh, the anchor of the whole thing is is why are you doing it uh, and what you're trying to what are you trying to achieve and the goal could be very specific and we're trying to make it very focused and specific because you obviously you can't aim at everything and and this is what you're going to measure at the end if your game is about raising funding we, we're going to measure it and if it's about raising awareness how do we measure it um, there is kind of a scale uh, you could be uh, uh, going for a modest uh, goal that says I'm only about raising awareness or, or kind of uh, conveying a message the other side of the scale is behavior change and some games are like the one I showed you with remission are really going all the way to say not only that I want this person to change opinions I really want him to change something in the real world that he's used to do every day and he's going to do it in a different way and that's kind of the holy grail and <clears throat> when you do something for behavior change uh, the intervention needs to be very persistent and very robust a uh, choice of platform we talked about it earlier um, after you know your audience and after you know your context and after you know what impact objectives or learning objectives you have for your game we're talking about choosing the right platform and huge differences even in terms of uh, budgets and scope between making a mobile game to making a full-scale console game or a Facebook game or a PC game. And, uh, and again, all those decisions should come from a very educated and thoughtful uh, perspective. Sustainability. Sustainability is, is a lot about money, but not only about money. Uh, in the class, obviously, you're not going to spend money and invest in your projects, but, uh, but this is something we'll discuss, and, and the idea of how you make something you, you take out to the world and more than a one-time experience. Do you have a plan to take it further? Even if you got a grant from a foundation, how this project is going to live beyond that? What are you going to prove with the first grant in order to get the next grant or maybe even make it self-sustainable by, by getting revenue or uh, donations, etc.? Only then we get to gameplay and gameplay is, some, is something we'll discuss a lot in the class um, because gameplay and game design because it's such a young uh, industry as a whole now I'm talking about games not only games for social impact the whole notion that uh, there is something called game design that is not about visual design it is about the mechanics of a game what makes a game fun and compelling is a relatively new idea and, you know, someone mentioned Jamie McGonigal, uh, which is a rare case of a game designer that people actually know. But if you think about it, the game designers are not as known as movie directors and uh, book authors. I think it will change, but it just shows you how new this whole thing is. And, and some of them are really amazing at what they do, um, but they're still behind the scenes and kind of sitting with their spreadsheets. And, and making sure the numbers work in the, just like you throw dice. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's the, that's the art of making games. Making sure that there is compelling gameplay. And in our case, making sure that the gameplay is related to the cause. What happens a lot is that people try to create educational games or games for social change, where the gameplay is one thing, and they try to put like public service announcements on top of it. And there's no connection between what you do in the game to what they're really trying to convey. And there's something we call verbs, the things you do in a game. And the things you do in a game should align with what you're trying to reach in terms of impact. Execution is, is something that obviously we do in a, in a small scale in the class, but is uh, after you have all this planning and after you have your design in place, there's a whole art Part of executing a game and unlike again unlike traditional media this is interactive and even from my experience with creating games I was always surprised how audiences reacted to a game I created um, it's very very different every time they might learn things you didn't intend to teach 
and they might not learn the things you really wanted them to learn. Um, and you can iterate and you can walk with this feedback and every person is, is kind of writing his own story when he plays a game, which is a very unique thing. Think about it again, compared to linear scripted media. When you go to a movie, you know how it begins and how it ends. With games, everyone has his own complete experience and it's very personal. Everyone moves at its own pace and you need to plan as much as you can, but you have to test and test and test. Um, and get the feedback of the audience in order to make it better. And, and the last one is assessment or evaluation that I mentioned before when I showed you some of the examples. This is something that becomes very critical to our work because people are no longer satisfied, especially funders, with the idea that, you know, we're just making games um, that are, you know, are for good and, you know, it's all great and the slogan is very appealing. They're, they they now want to see results. And in a way, it's interesting. They're more um, demanding than with other media. And I think that some of it is because, you know, we're talking about this inversion of the perception of games that is hard for people to make. So we need proof. But I think it's also that in their instinct, they understand that it's, it's a piece of software. At the end of the day, it's not only, you know, media, it's, it's code. And when you have code, you can measure a lot of things. And the, the very uh, uh, recent trend in evaluation is called the embedded evaluation or embedded assessment that is not only about asking people and making those traditional tests before and after, it's actually about planting indicators in the code. And when you have big numbers of people playing the game, even without asking them one question, you can get a lot of data and understand where they're stuck, what things they do more than others. And it's very relevant to learning because you can start to see how people make progress and what features are really contributing to that and which, which features are, are not. So I hope the last part was not too techy, but, uh, but again, this is, this is a very exciting thing that is, is relevant to games more than any other media, I think. The idea that you can actually measure a lot of things in terms of of the impact that you're aiming for and, and you're achieving. Um, let's do another pause and uh, maybe do the last yep. uh, Q&A. That sounds great to me. <laughs> so we had a few questions that came out. One was from Ji Young, and you spoke about it briefly, but it's this idea of what makes a game fun and how do you design that. She says, I love serious games that make people do something and that bring new knowledge or um, introduce you to society. But on the other hand, most of these games aren't fun. What is the most important factor for designing? Is it the education part or the fun? So, so first of all, in defense of uh, <laughs> what so-called serious games, I would say that it's really changing. I mean, it's true that uh, in the first few years we suffered from a lot of uh, what I call uh, not only me but the, the, the chocolate-covered broccoli. That at the end of the day, you know it's broccoli, even even if it looks like chocolate. Um, this is changing. We see more and more very high production, very interesting games. You can find some of them on the site of Games for Change and play them for free. Commercial companies that are trying to, to you know, to make uh, social impact games. Um, artists that are trying to, to chime in. So, so we see better products. And I think that to your question, the key is to balance it well. So it can't be that it's... The, the two uh, failures in our space are people that are taking the educational content and make it, you know, more important than anything else, the center of the experience. And instead of letting the players explore, it becomes a preachy. People, people that play games don't want to be, you know, preached. They, they don't want you to give them the solution. They want to ask questions and find their answers or even just stay with the questions. They want to explore. They want to even test the boundaries. And this is very important. When, when a teacher makes a game, it's usually going into right or wrong. And games are not about right or wrong. Games are about understanding systems and understanding rules. Uh, the other extreme is commercial companies that make very thin uh, you know, uh, games for change that the, the everything is sacrificed for the, the fun aspect of the game 
and the content is, is really thin or not accurate. Um, I would say that, the, again, there is a way in between, which, which it's, very, it's very challenging. But there is a way, and I've seen many games like this, that are both challenging and meaningful. Just like, just like a movie can do the same. Uh, Martha Berry has a question, which is, what programs would students be using, and would those be taught in class or before the program starts? Um, this is, this is still, still to be defined, exactly how we're going to do it. But the way we're thinking about it now is that we're going to introduce a few platforms that could make your life easier. Uh, we're not expecting you to code. We're not expecting you. I mean, you could do that if you feel comfortable with it. But it's really not the intention. The intention is to give you tools that could actually um, make it fun and make it faster to create something that you could uh, show others. And, and get responses to. Um, so we're going to share a few tools. However, if you come with a tool that you're very excited about and we're, we didn't necessarily discuss, we'll make sure to, to guide you and, and give you the, you know, the option to use it. So we're not going to restrict you from using something. Again, in, in this case, the, the technology is more um, to serve you and to get you to your goal than to really study or learn new technologies. That's, that's less our goal. And so another really great question that's been asked um, is by Peggy Siegel, and she wants to know, for students who are not only playing but co-creating the game, how is Impact being measured and the performance as far as learning? So, uh, I mean, it's a great question. Um, this is... This is where we, we in, in terms of uh, using games and evaluating it, we're going to blurry places that uh, they are very far from the way, if you think about it, that we measure students' performance in, in schools today, especially with some of the newest uh, uh, federal programs like No Child Left Behind. Mm -hmm. they, they really, um, they're very, very precise in, in uh, measuring knowledge gained or skills gained. Um, when we go to, to kids making games, we're not measuring that. It's not about acquiring certain knowledge or it's, it's again, going back to what I call 21st century skills. It's, it's more about, do they, can they uh, solve problems that they, that they, uh, they encounter? Uh, how do they think uh, about systems? Can they collaborate to reach a, to reach a goal with other team members? Um, even entrepreneurship, in the sense that they come with their own vision and they create something. So those are, are soft skills, but arguably in the 21st century environment, they're more important than, well, I wanted to say cracking a formula, but maybe I should. Anyway, <laughs> then, then certain things that are taught at school, let's say it like that. I mean, the whole idea that you acquire skills that are much more abstract, but at the same time are very applicable for, you know, the new working environment in 21st century. Right. And Jiyoung has another question, which is about when you're creating the games, creating financial plans that go with that. Is that going to be part of the class? And if you can sort of brief over it. Um, it I mean, it, it, it's not going to be the focus. We're going to touch it. It's not going to be the focus. I mean, we're much more interested in, in rolling the sleeves and actually making products. And as I said, letting people play them and respond to them than about creating documents and, and plans. It does need to be a part of your pitch. So there's going to be an opportunity to pitch your idea and, and get uh, you know, the board's approval. And one thing we plan to have are guests from the outside. So we're going to bring, uh, you know, and some of the top game designers we know, and some people that are kind of leading this space to actually give you crit, uh, you know, critique, and, um, and that's kind of uh, where that thinking will come into play. And so it looks like those are most of our questions for right now. But then I don't see any others. So that's the last question. Yeah, this is the last class of questions. Yeah. Does anyone have any, any? Any last questions? We have kind of a few minutes. There is, there is, uh, I don't want to say so. Will we focus on how to find other technology? That was the Jiyoung one. Okay. 
Mayor's 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 Mayor